Okay, starting recording. Um, I accidentally began lecturing before I started the uh, recording. So just to recap very quickly, sociobiology applied to human behavior, trying to explain the way humans act using um, evolutionary reasoning, using the logic behind natural selection is called evocyte or evolutionary psychology. Does it work? Well, it was kicked off in 1975 uh, with a book by E.O. Wilson. He recently died. He was a country boy from Alabama uh, who became one of the, probably the world's foremost expert on ants. Uh, he was a professor at Harvard. And in parallel with his work on ants, uh, he wrote a book in 1975 applying evolutionary reasoning, the logic behind natural selection, to looking at behavior. His book was called Sociobiology, The New Synthesis. The first part of the book just deals with you know, many different species, but at the end, he starts trying to apply it to humanity. And this is the part that freaked everybody out and set off a storm of controversy. Uh, he was getting up to talk at the 1978 conference of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science, science and a uh, protester rushed the stage, grabbed the pitcher of ice water, and dumped it on his head, yelling, you're all wet, Wilson, uh, right as he was about to speak. And Wilson was accused of racism, he was accused of sexism, and he was accused of espousing biological determinism. And I was talking about that earlier. That's the idea that genes is our destiny and that humans must inevitably look, act, and behave in certain ways simply because of their biological nature, regardless of ethics, morals, or education. Uh, Wilson is often accused of uh, promoting the idea that, you know, genes basically determine everything that's important about who and what you are. Uh, I should mention that since his recent death, I really should have looked up the details first. I'm a little bit fuzzy on them, but some correspondence of his has come to light uh, in which he uh, espoused some rather racist ideas much more openly than he really did in his published work. So is there a racial subtext behind this? Not just the idea that humans do what their genes tell them to do, but different racial groups do what their genes tell them to do. There is a subtext behind this, and it's something I wish I had had time to look into a little bit more carefully. If you're detecting a bit of a whiff about these ideas, you are not necessarily wrong. The prevailing opinion in sociology and anthropology in the 70s was that virtually all of human culture is learned behavior. Wilson says, no, the genes hold culture on a leash. The leash is very long, but inevitably values will be constrained in accordance with their effects on the human gene pool. The brain is a product of evolution. Human behavior, like the deepest capacities for emotional response, which drive and guide it, is the circuitous technique by which human genetic material has been and will be kept intact. So the idea is that we behave the way that they do. We behave the way that we do because at some level, those behaviors, those behaviors increase the odds that we're gonna pass on our DNA and they increase the odds that our ancestors passed on their DNA. Um, if there is such a thing as a gene with alleles, some of which make you like having sex and some of which make you hate it, then the alleles for liking sex are likely to become more common and the alleles for hating it would be likely to become more rare, right? Make sense? 
The truth is it's a lot more complicated than just one gene that has two different alleles. You know, one for being horny and one for being not. It's a lot more complicated than that, but that's the crux of Wilson's argument, that there are genes that affect what we do and those genes can become more common or more rare depending on their effect on reproduction, just like genes for any physical feature. Here's the problem. Human behavior is ridiculously complicated compared to other species. Uh, I came across this headline about a woman in a sumo wrestler suit who assaulted her ex-girlfriend in a gay pub after she waved at a man who was dressed as a Snickers bar. No other species does this shit, <laughs> okay? Fruit flies do not dress up in sumo wrestler suits and beat up their lesbian girlfriends for waving at other fruit flies who were dressed as Snickers bars. Um, I forgot to include it, but I came across another headline along the lines of uh, the worst pain I ever felt was uh, it was a newspaper in Britain that was the, the worst pain I ever felt was when I put popping candy under my foreskin. Like nobody does that. Well, people do that, but nobody else, no other species does that. Other species are too smart. Other species don't even have popping candy. Human behavior is freaking weird. We are bizarre compared to other species. And we're also exceptionally phenotypically plastic. Um, you know, the reason that we're all speaking and understanding English and not something else has nothing to do with genes and everything to do with what we've learned. You know, we all learned you know, either in infancy or maybe a little bit later uh, to speak and understand, you know, standard English. You know, it is entirely a, pro a result of learning and culture that we're speaking in English in when they go in Paruski na priya. Mine go in Hrvatski jezik. That that was Croatian. Sorry, Croatian? it has been a long time since I studied it, but Croatian language would be Hrvatski jezik. Yeah, the the reason we're having this conversation in English is entirely culture. Uh, the reason that we are wearing most of us t-shirts and, and trousers and not wrap around lava lava skirts or strategically arranged palm leaves uh, or um, you know something like that is not due to your genes. It's entirely due to what you've learned and what you grew up with. And here's why this whole biological predestination argument made people nervous. And this is why that protester dumped the ice pitcher on Wilson's head. Uh, that's a hand, that's a Nazi propaganda poster from the 30s. And that hand is pulling back the curtain on Del Yuda, the Jew. And you'll notice that this is phenotypically a stereotype uh, the big hooked nose and the fat lip is supposedly what Jews look like. In practice, no, they don't necessarily, but the Jew is not only phenotypically different, the Jew is innately evil because he is the Kriegsanstifter, uh, the instigator of war, and the Kriegsverlängerer, the uh, prolonger of war. And in Nazi ideology, being a Jew was entirely a matter of genetics. You could have had your family all convert to Christianity, and it didn't make any difference as far as the Nazis were concerned. It didn't matter how many generations your family was Christian. Uh, if you were descended from Jews, you were a Jew. There was a whole kid's book. Sorry, thinking about controversy as to what ought to go on to kids' library shelves today. There was a whole kids book called uh, Del Gift Pits, uh, The Poisonous Mushroom, uh, alerting children to the danger of Jews lurking in society because of their biological descent. They could not be anything other than evil. You will hear versions of this argument espoused today 
used to be just way the heck over on the far right among the crazies. Now they're not nearly as quiet. Uh, we've seen this in, well, race relations in this country. For a long time in many southern states, you were considered black if you had, quote, one drop of blood that was African. And if you had that one drop of blood, you were not us black folks people, you were them other people. Uh, I read a medical article from a southern doctor just before the uh, Civil War that listed an impressive links, number of ways in which uh, black people were fundamentally so different that we shouldn't give them white, the type of medical treatment that white people got. Um, the example I gave was that somebody, the example he gave was somebody had dissected a bunch of people and claimed that black people had dark colored brains. And then when somebody else did some more dissections and said, you know, I can't tell the difference, you know, they're not, the response was, oh, but they really do. The ones that had light colored brains must have been diseased. So you can't win for losing. Either you've got a dark colored brain or you're diseased. Like, you know, what the hell? But yeah, that idea that people with different genetic backgrounds are fundamentally different in behavior and psychology and nature and, for lack of a better word, in soul, that has a very long and a very poisonous history, and it's led humans to do some of the worst things that they're capable of doing. Um, U.S. slavery, Nazi oppression of the Jews, uh, more examples than I can think of. You know, your world history class, you know, the, the textbook is going to drip with blood from examples of this sort of thing. That's Yugoslavian War. Okay, the Yugoslavian War, e even though in that case, you know, you, you could have argued that there's no genetic distinction worth talking about between a Serb and a Croat. And I mean, I was only there for a couple of days, but even I met uh, like a Serbian guy with a Croatian girlfriend. Really hot, by the way. Not that I said anything. What's that? Yeah. So, or the, like the Hutu and the Tutsi in Rwanda had been living together for so long that there's no real genetic difference between the two, and yet that wasn't enough to stop them from bloody genocide. Uh, but a lot of ethnic conflicts, people will resort to these kind of biologically based arguments, and they're shit. Oh, whoops. And here's another rather controversial example. We've already talked about Bateman's rule. The sex that has less to invest in reproduction, which is usually the males, although not always, uh, because male sperm are smaller and eggs are bigger. The sex with less to invest in reproduction will maximize fitness by reproducing as much as possible. Uh, if you're a male and it doesn't cost you that much to father an offspring, then if you have genes that make you father as many offspring as possible, those genes will get passed on. If you're a female and you have to invest a lot in successfully reproduction, you can't increase fitness by having as much sex as possible, right? There is, if we talk about humans, you know, okay, uh, the, the Duggars are kind of an extreme example uh, they had, what, 19 kids, uh, whereas I think the record for a human male with the largest number of offspring was a uh, medieval Moroccan ruler named Mulai Ismail the Bloodthirsty, who was evidently thirsty for something else because he had, I believe, 1,600 sons, probably an equal number of daughters, uh, with the help of a very large collection of wives and concubines, he had said. You know, certainly he did not have one wife that did all of that. It was like, damn. Okay. So if you apply this literally to humans, you could see this as giving an aura of scientific approval 
uh, to something like this. I don't know if any of you remember this. This was a reality TV show uh, about Hugh Hefner and uh, the three uh, very blonde and very uh, pneumatic uh, girlfriends that he had at the time. This was on TV in what, like 06, 07, maybe this is a little bit uh, uh, before your time. But you could argue that Hefner is simply doing what men are biologically programmed to do, which is reproduce with as many females as possible because that's how they increase the number of copies of genes that they'll leave. Um, you could, I wouldn't actually try this, but I'm envisioning a man saying to his wife, honey, I'm really sorry I cheated on you uh, with those three floozies I picked up in bars and uh, also with your sister. Uh, but it's not really my fault because I've been genetically selected uh, through many generations to engage in behaviors that maximize the odds that I'm going to uh, reproduce. I think if you actually tried that, that might be the last thing you ever said. And, you know, the somebody during, the, during Clinton's presidential sex scandal said something like, uh, if I ever said the kind of things he said, the last thing I would hear would be my wife uh, saying, how do I reload this thing? Anyway, so yeah, you could see this as giving an aura of scientific approval to something that's decidedly unsavory. And there is, okay, there was this community that has flourished while online called the pickup artist community. PUAs, and PUAs are frequently POSs, but what they do is try to use psychology to, um, well, exactly what it says, to pick up and have sex with as many women as possible in social situations. Um, going after, you know, if they can, they'll go home with a different, different woman every night. And they publish manuals for this sort of thing. And the manuals often use evolutionary reasoning. You know, the idea being that, you know, men have been selected to seek sexual diversity. Women have been selected for, to prefer mates that are high status and providers. So here are some things you can do to make it look like you are a high status male with high quality genes. Um, and, you know, then they list them. Uh, that whole pickup artist community bases a lot of the practical advice they give for, you know, betting women on a kind of folk version of evolutionary psychology. Uh, incidentally, a bunch of would-be pickup artists who found out that their tricks don't really work uh, tended to move into a different community called the incels. And the in involuntary celibates. And you can look this stuff up if you want to. The incels are basically convinced that they will never get to have sex because women have been conditioned and selected to only want the high-status males. So there's a small number of high status men, they call chads, uh, who are bagging all the women who would never have sex with them, but will throw their legs open for their chads, those sluts. And no, I'm not kidding about any of this. And there are incels that have gotten violent about it. There have been a couple of mass shootings perpetrated by incels who were convinced they were low status males that would never get laid and were so angry about it that the only thing they could do was take out aggressive urges. You know, there are rapes that are committed by people like this. I can't remember the guy's name. And even if I did, I wouldn't want to give him more fame, but there was someone who, there was a Canadian guy who gunned down a bunch of nursing students, and there was a guy at, I think, UC Santa Barbara, uh, who I think killed six uh, sorority, uh, sorority members. And I can't remember exactly when, because we, it's getting kind of hard to keep track of mass shootings. 
but yeah, there is a whole subculture of people who try to take advantage of women, and if it goes sour, sometimes ultimately kill them because of this application of you know evolutionary reasoning to human behavior that began with sociobiology and is filtered down through the pickup artist community. Okay. So women have evolutionary reasoning to be yeah, of course. You know, if you're a, you know, female hanging flies go, you know, are willing to mate with the males that bring them the biggest, you know, dead insects as food items. So clearly the same logic applies to humans. And, you know, women are clearly programmed to go with the male that can offer them more resources. So I'm not saying she's a gold digger, but she really is. Or at least that's the way, that's the way the reasoning goes. Okay, for the record, I do not personally approve of that, but you will find people like Google, you know, Google some of the things that people are saying on incel communities on social media, and I'm, I'm not fucking kidding, it will turn your stomach. Incel with a C. Yeah, yeah, incel, I-N-C-E-L. And, what's that? Incel, the side of guys Okay, maybe, maybe don't do this right now, but you know, go home and, and do this sometime and it, it, it'll put your teeth on edge. Here's the other problem, it's easy. You have to be careful about this in all of evolutionary biology. My old professor, David Wake, at, uh, in the People's Republic of Berkeley, used to talk about just so stories. And I don't know if this current generation remembers these, but they were children's stories uh, by an author named Rudyard Kipling, a British author in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And there were stories like, there was a story of how the elephant got his trunk. And the story is that elephants used to have short noses, but a very curious young elephant who asked lots of questions wanted to know what the crocodile ate for dinner. So he went to the crocodile and asked, and the crocodile bit his nose and tried to pull him in the water and stretched his nose out into a trunk. Oh, uh, another one of those just so stories you might like because it's set in South America. Uh, it was the story of how the armadillo came to be. And it was a story about how in South America you have jaguars and uh, they would eat turtles if they could, and they would eat porcupines if they could. And turtle and porcupine got together because they were tired of always being hunted by jaguar. And um, uh, porcupine started, uh, you know, learning how to get those spikes out of the way and curl up to protect his belly. And turtles started loosening his shell plate so that he could curl up more easily. And basically the two of them came together to become an armadillo. Okay, it's a fun story. Obviously this is not real, uh, but, but they were fun. Uh, that was Rudyard Kipling's Just So Stories. And the term has been applied in evolutionary biology to, for explanations that are, that makes sense, but they're either wrong or they're untestable, or in some cases, they don't actually make sense. Um, and here's an example, a uh, paper back in 2007, a couple of scientists um, got a bunch of UK residents. Uh, by the way, these are residents of uh, European descent. And they asked them to compare paired blocks of color. They just show them two blocks of color on a screen and ask them to select which ones they like best. Uh, you can see the colors down there on the x-axis. And you will notice that males turned out to have the strongest preferences for blues and greens, right? Their peak is over on the right side of the spectrum. Females tended to prefer reds and pinks. Okay, with me there. They came up with an evolutionary psychology explanation for why that works. Um, 
Think back to when our distant ancestors were all running about on the Serengeti plains of Africa. You know, that is ultimately where human ancestry lies. We're all African if you go back far enough. Some of us have just wandered quite a bit. And at one time, all humans were hunter-gatherers. Um, people would hunt for meat animals, uh, often but not exclusively. That was the men that would do that. And women would gather plant foods. Uh, this is the way a lot of tribes lived, and a few still do. I mean, there are still some indigenous people in places like the Amazon Basin uh, who still live like that. Uh, and at one time, the evidence is that basically everybody lives like that. And the idea is that since it's usually the women that go out and gather plant foods, women needed to be sensitive to red and pink colors because those are the colors of ripe berries. Right? If you are a woman and you really, really are attuned to red and pink, you'll have an easier time finding delicious ripe berries and your family will have better food and you'll prosper and you'll have more kids. If you're a hunter-gatherer woman and you don't like red or you can't see red or it doesn't you know, grab your attention in any way, you are likelier to bring home unripe berries that are still green and still sour and not nutritious and you won't have as many kids. So, Based on that logic, uh, women should, or you would expect that women would like pink and red, men who are not hunters and gatherers and are, you know, men who are going out and killing mammoths with spears and things like that. You know, they're not gatherers. It's not that important to them. So they never evolved this strong preference for reds and pinks. Do you see the logic? That they're that they're invoking. Anybody see any problems with it? Yeah. Well, first off, the sample size for this study is pretty small. Okay. It's small, and there's another bias that I'll show you in just a minute. It it hasn't shown up on this slide, but we'll see it soon. Okay. Any other problems? Yeah. Okay, it, yeah, color blindness is still very much a thing. And are um, men more likely to be colorblind? Okay, yeah, red green color blindness is much more common among men. Um, what else? I'm like, why would think about the genes involved? There are genes that influence your sensitivity towards towards colors, and maybe there's genes that influence the way your brain processes them. What are the odds that only women would have those? You know, think about it. 22 of our 23 chromosome pairs are identical. There's no difference in inheritance pattern between my chromosome one and, and yours, or yours, or, or yours. You know, you could maybe argue that people might evolve to prefer the red colors of ripe fruit and berries, but why would it affect only one sex? You know, you wouldn't necessarily expect it to. I mean, the only chromosome that only one sex ever gets is the Y chromosome, and that's small and doesn't really have many genes on it other than the little genetic switch area that makes you sprout up the top. And to whatever you call the things next to the path. You can tell me later. Yes? We are also many, many, many generations removed from the hunting and gathering era. Right. Um, and so why this sort of bias or the, the, the colors that they mm -hmm. stipulate here would still exist is... Okay. You could argue that it persisted into the time when humanity developed farming because you know, farmers still you know, are picking ripe red apples instead of green ones, even if they're not gathering them from the wilderness. Um, but yet, it has certainly been a very long time since most of our ancestors were hunter-gatherers. Um, 
Oh, I forgot. I came up with an additional explanation as to why girls like pink and boys like blue. As everybody knows, women are moderators. You know, men get aggressive and violent and bump chest and go and all that. You know, women are the ones that are emotionally sensitive, right? Men know how to have emotions. Emotion, you know, sensitivity no good when killing woolly mammoth. You know, men strong. Men bump chests. Men like football. Men not have time for emotional things. Women have to be sensitive because women are caring. Women would often be carers for children. So it's adaptive for a woman to be sensitive to red and pink because, you know, red tones on skin are an emotional cue. People might turn red when they're getting embarrassed or they're violent. Uh, babies, of course, get flushed if they have a fever. So women that are attuned to red shades in human skin would be likelier to leave offspring than women that didn't because they would be able to see, for example, and care for uh, sick children. And they would be able to see and care for aggressive men and, you know, talk them down off the ledge or something like that. The immediate problem with that is that only works if your base skin color is very pale, you know, African people get aggressive and get fevers and you can't really see, you know, a skin flush, but somehow they manage to get along just fine. There we go. The hunter-gatherer theory proposes that female brains should be specialized for gathering related ta tasks. Um, trichromacy or modern adaptations in primate evolution Thought to have evolved the facilitated ripe yellow fruit or red leaves in green foliage. As a gatherer, the female would need to be more aware of color information than the hunter. And again, here's a, here's a female, and you can clearly see that she is attuned to emotional states because she's blushing, and the person that she's thinking of, which I guess is also her, is uh, blushing. So females have this need to discriminate subtle changes in skin color due to emotional states and social sexual signals. Females may have honed these adaptations for their roles as caregivers and empathizers. So women, you caregivers, you got to be nice. You detect blushing in skin. Men not have emotion. Men kill mammoth. Men bring back woolly mammoth steak to eat. Woman cook it. The funny thing is that they got results and they published these, even though they completely contradicted their own findings. Uh, this was done with uh, Chinese subjects living in the UK. And the sample size is admittedly smaller, but the difference is that both men and women preferred redder shades than the European descended subjects, and there was very little difference between them. Uh, Chinese guys and Chinese gals apparently both like red. So does this mean that the Chinese never went through this hunter-gatherer stage? It turns out that, first of all, the Western preference for boys in blue and girls in pink only dates back to about 1940. Uh, before that, it was common to dress little girls in blue, uh, in part because blue is traditionally associated in Christian artwork uh, with the Virgin Mary. You know, even today, if you go to any Catholic church and they've got paintings of the various saints, uh, the Virgin Mary is going to be wearing blue. I mean, the only female saint that's going to be wearing red is Mary Magdalene, who in this may not be historically true, but in church tradition, she was seen as the reformed prostitute. Uh, a woman taken in adultery who was wearing scarlets and is always crying because Jesus came and now she feels very sorry. Um, but yeah, blue was seen as feminine because it's associated with Mary. 
uh, was very common to dress little boys as pink because pink was seen as a toned down, not fully adult version of red, which was seen as forceful and fiery. So that preference in modern Western culture for you know, blue for boys and pink for girls is only about 80 years old. Uh, before that, the uh, preferences were quite different. And now, I'm okay, uh, I've got a kid and we used to buy him a lot of toys. Now he has a laptop and plays Roblox and uh, we don't have to buy him physical objects quite so much. Uh, but if you go shopping for toys right now, there's a lot of toys that are being sold in a blue version and a pink version. Like you can get a set of building blocks that are mostly red, yellow, and blue for boys and the same damn building blocks, except they are pink and pastel for girls. What's that? And more expensive. And more expensive. Um, so I saw these, these little toy cars that a kid can get into and push around with his feet and go careening around the backyard and you know run over pets and things like that. Uh, that's being sold in a blue version for boys and a pink version for girls. That has nothing to do with genetics and everything to do with marketing. If you get just a unisex set of blocks, then one kid can use it and then pass it on to the next one. If you can convince parents that blue is manly and pink is girly, then if your first child is a boy, and your second child is a girl, oh no, you don't want your girl to play with blue blocks because they might grow up to be, I don't know, feminist or something evil like that. You buy them a second set of girl blocks so they can have girl things. That's entirely down to culture and specifically it's entirely down to marketing. This is the way the toy companies are trying to sell more product. We have no evidence that those preferences have any genetic basis. Oh, I almost forgot. The reason why the Chinese have stronger preferences toward red is probably because in Chinese culture, red is a color of good luck and good fortune. If you go to a Chinese restaurant, you know, if it's actual Chinese people that are running it, they will probably have red decorations and maybe red paper lanterns and, you know, red banners and things. Uh, if you grow up in a Chinese family, then every Chinese New Year, uh, you get good luck presents of money from your parents and your grandparents and all that. And it's traditionally in red paper envelopes. Like if you grew up able to buy some really awesome toys because you've got really generous grandparents who give you a couple of hundred dollars every year in a red paper envelope, you probably freaking like red. Right? A red envelope means I can finally get that Xbox or whatever it is there. What are people buying these days? X. What's that? Drugs. Sorry? Drugs. Drugs? Okay, a red paper envelope means I can finally buy those drugs. Um, let's do something a little more positive than that. <laughs> let's talk about the opioid crisis. Okay. All right, I can finally buy this expensive thing that I really, really want. You know, if that happened in your family, you would probably really learn to like red regardless of your gender. So this is a case of a just so story. <laughs> Somebody finds a preference and comes up with an evolutionary story as to why we have that preference. Um, we have it because we used to be hunter gatherers on the plains of Africa and women were the emotionally sensitive gender who needed to read other people's emotional states and they cared for babies and needed to know when they had fevers and they gathered and they needed to be able to find ripe uh, fruit. So therefore women have been naturally selected to love things that are red and pink. Manly men went out and hunted mammoth, did not need to particularly care for red and pink because men are not supposed to have emotions and are not supposed to like berries. Oh. Okay, 
you can make up all kinds of stories like that. I mean, okay, I tell you what, men hunt mammoth, hunt mammoth in big groups. Uh, mammoth very large. Uh, women must go out and wander long distances to gather ripe berries because berry bushes are scattered all over our ancient homeland. Um, women have greater risk of uh, getting separated from group because they are all scattered about seeking ripe berries. Therefore, it is adaptive for women to ask for directions when they get lost. Men traveling in larger groups need no such thing. And now I have just come up with an evolutionary explanation for why men refuse to ask for directions. First of all, I don't really know if men refuse to ask for directions or not. Second of all, I just pulled that explanation completely out of my, well, never mind where, but I just made that up. And it's easy to, trivially easy to come up with something that sounds like a really good story and yet doesn't have a basis in fact or isn't even particularly tested. So you've got to be very careful with, uh, with evolutionary psychology reasoning because there is a lot of really crap science uh, that's gotten out there and is in circulation uh, that simply doesn't pass muster. Uh, what time is it, by the way? 11.07. Okay, let's finish this and then take another break. There are some cases, however, where it does seem to work. I mean, on one level, you know, think about altruism in human families. Um, raising a child is a ridiculous investment, right? Yes. Most parents are willing to make that investment. And you can see that, you know, humans that love their children and feed them and take care of their needs are going to leave more offspring than humans that drop kick babies, right? Yes. So it is not unreasonable to think that there are genes somewhere that encourage you know, humans to take care of their offspring. And those probably evolved a long time before humans were even human. You know, it's basically the same for all mammals, that mammals that don't care, take care of their offspring don't pass their genes on. And so probably these, you know, if probably those genes are there because they've been selected for, because humans that lack the genes for wanting to take care of your kids are not going to pass on their genes. Humans that do have them will pass on their genes. So at some level, this works. In many cases, it turns out not to work. And in many cases, it's a very, very easy argument to misuse in rather unpleasant ways. But here's a little bit more about one case where it does seem to work. OK, human babies have a very long childhood. When they're born, they are utterly helpless and can't do anything. It might take them about a year just to be able to minimally walk. Uh, it might take them a couple more years to learn where to poop. Um, it might take them, you know, kids on farms probably start doing chores from a pretty early age, but it takes several years uh, before a child can start contributing to the survival of a family. And I mean, in our society, our kids might not have to contribute to contribute labor to a household until they turn 18. And human parents have to invest a ridiculous amount of energy to raise a child successfully. Even in cultures where you're not expected to pay for piano lessons or soccer teams or Xboxes, even in cultures that don't have that, college. or college, even in cultures that don't have college, parents still have to nurse their offspring, and that is a big energy expenditure. I, I think I mentioned this earlier, that nursing twins burns as many calories as basic training. Um, and children need a lot of care and a lot of teaching before they can do anything on their own. 
And in most societies, both parents invest a great deal. That's another reason why Bateman's rule does not simply apply to humans, um, is because we're a species where it's so exhausting to raise kids that in most societies, it is the norm that a child will have multiple caregivers, uh, a mother and a father, and in most cases, relatives on both sides as well will pitch in. I mean, that African saying, it takes a village to raise a child is, you know, in most societies, that's quite true. You know, you need a lot of people pitching in to raise a child successfully. Here's the thing. Consider the plight of stepchildren. A stepchild <coughs> shares genes with its biological parent, but not with its step-parent. Uh, Cinderella over here uh, has some of her genes from her father and some of her genes from her biological mom, but she does not share any genes with the wicked stepmother at all. And stepchildren do not directly contribute to a stepparent's fitness. And that sets up what they, uh, Margot Daly and so-and-so Wilson called the Cinderella effect in 1996. An awful lot of cultures have stories about wicked stepmothers. Um, you find them in India, you find them among native tribes. Uh, you certainly find it in European folk tales like Cinderella. There's a lot of wicked stepmothers out there. Does it have any basis in fact? The single greatest risk factor for child abuse is the presence of a step parent in the household. Uh, the X axis or the Y axis there is victims per 10,000 children. And it may soothe you to know that child abuse is still relatively rare in a family with one of one natural parent, one step parent, and one child between zero and two. Um, only six out of 10,000 children suffer significant physical abuse, you know, which may be comforting for some, but the incidence of abuse in parents with a step parent, in families with a step parent in that age bracket is six times higher than in households with both biological parents. All right, and that, that discrepancy uh, drops off a bit uh, once the kids are old enough to hit back. Uh, but you can still see that the incidence of abuse in families with a child between 14 and 17 is still twice as high in step parent households as in natural parent households. Yes. Do you know how those uh, sorry statistics compare to um, like foster parents or uh, adopted parents who okay seek, seek out okay a child. Yeah, here's, here's the thing. The thing with step parents is, zoom type, is they're not fed. Yeah. You know, if I hope this doesn't happen, but if my wife dies and I feel like getting married again, I can marry anybody regardless of whether or not they're a good fit for my son or, or not. With foster parents, there is at least some attempt to vet them. And the parents that go through a formal adoption, they've got to jump through any number of hoops. And nobody says that step parents are biologically programmed to hate their kids. You can have step parents who are wonderful, uh, probably much more often than you have step parents that are abusive. And you can have adoptive parents that are wonderful because they want to. Uh, but step parents don't necessarily want to be parents. And step parents aren't vetted. You know, if my wife died and I could marry an axe murderer, you know, who goes after my kid with a hatchet, I, I would not do such a thing, but there's nothing to stop me from doing it at this point. Um, Daly and Wilson looked at a case of child murder. Fortunately, children being murdered by their parents is really rare. Uh, they couldn't even get a meaningful y-axis in victims for 10,000 children. The y-axis there is victims per million years of co-residence. 
So a year of co-residence is one child living with either two parents or one parent and one step-parent for one year. You have to do a little stats to kind of amplify the signal. But the incidence of child murder in with children between zero and two is about 600 times higher in step-parent households than in households with both biological parents. It's vanishingly rare when a child has both biological parents. It's still rare, but much less rare in families where there's a step-parent. This has been looked at in other ways, it seems to be, by the way, cross-cultural. It's not just Westerners that do this. I think this was data from Canada. Uh, but similar biases have been found in hunter-gatherer societies. There's a tribe called the Ache in Peru uh, that found much the same thing. A child's likelihood of survival is much lower if there's a step-parent than if there's uh, two, two parents. Uh, this has been observed, I think, in Caribbean groups and in African people. It may actually be universal in the human species. And it also plays out in less extreme things than abuse and murder. That's what tends to draw um, attention. But on average, step parents uh, make less positive investments in their stepchildren. They play with them less. Uh, someone did this study in Albuquerque, New Mexico, back about 20 years ago. Uh, step parents contribute less money to stepchildren's education than they do to their biological children. Uh, step parents are less likely to take their stepchildren for medical care. Uh, there was, they found this out in Australia, there was a greater risk of stepchildren dying in accidents, like falling into a pool. And in this case, it's not because anybody was trying to kill the kid, but step parents may be just a tiny bit less vigilant, um, less careful about locking the pool gates or something like that. And again, that does not mean that all step parents are neglectful or abusive. Uh, they can be perfectly wonderful parents. If there is some sort of biological urge, it's one that many people get over and surmount and do fine with. But the situation may just be, we're not talking about infanticide among lions or lander monkeys. Uh, in fact, it may be to the advantage of a step parent to take care of stepchildren because a step parent that doesn't, the biological parent might reject that parent, and the step parent will not get to have any kids of their own. So the idea is that in humanity, the reasons why step parents just don't go out and murder their, their step kids the way that a lion would, is that step parents that do that would be prevented from doing so by the biological parent. So we're not as extreme as that. But it may take more conscious efforts on a step parent's part to shell out the enormous amount of energy it takes to raise a kid. It may take more conscious effort on their part and they may have lower tolerance. Raising children are annoying little shits most of the time. Eventually they grow up and you can have conversations with them. But when they're li really little, they scream and you can't get any sleep. And uh, then they start learning to talk and then they start mouthing off. And, uh, and uh, it's all kind of, kind of a mess from there. Children are a colossal pain in the ass. And it takes, even for a biological parent, there are times when you think about, you know, throwing them out of a closed window. Uh, there are times when you really do understand why there are some animals that eat their own offspring. Um, so far, my kid has gotten uh, to the age of almost 11 and a half, and we have not yet made good on our threats to uh, eating. Um, but don't think we haven't been tempted. You know, kids are annoying. And most step parents can rise to the occasion, but it may take more conscious effort on their part. Their tolerance for 
children screaming or you know messing their diapers or things like that may be lower and they may need to consciously resolve to treat their kids equally so that the step kid does not get the short end of the stick you know so that the biological kid does not get their college education paid for and the step kid has to go work at mcdonald's some parents can do that but it is a challenge and it may not come quite as naturally so the cinderella effect might be a good example of evolutionary psychology working as proposed but you've got to be careful with it because there are a lot of cases where evolutionary psychology doesn't really support what people think it does and doesn't work very well as a science. Evolution's interaction with human behavior is an immensely complicated field, and it's very good not to jump to conclusions and to always look exceptionally critically at claims that it makes. So on that note, I will now stop the recording.